Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the first webinar from the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine of 2022. Uh, I think we have a wonderful hour uh, lined up, uh, and um, on behalf of the Translational Biology section, I am very proud uh, to uh, welcome you. The session today is on stem cell therapies potential in the pandemic era. And we've chosen this topic because as we enter the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, research in many areas, but particularly research into complex therapies, such as stem cell therapies, has really been hugely advanced as a result of the pr really pressing need to find new therapies for acute respiratory distress syndrome, whether caused by COVID or by other causes. We have two real experts for you today, Professor Jared Curley and Professor Antonio Artigas. Uh, we expect uh, an interactive session. Uh, we will have the two talks to start, and then we will have an interactive question and answer session. So please put your questions uh, into the chat function uh, on the uh, ESICM TV page that you are watching this webinar through. And we will then take those questions and put them to our experts. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor Jared Curley is going to speak on the topic, Insights from Trials in COVID-19. Professor Curley is Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And he's a consultant in intensive care medicine and anesthesia at Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. Uh, Professor Curley's research interests focus on the development of new therapies for ARDS and sepsis using preclinical models and then moving to early phase clinical studies. His research group is funded by the Health Research Board in Ireland, the US Department of Defense, and the European Innovation Council. So Jared, I'm really looking forward to your talk uh, and learning lots about the new trials that are uh, being reported for stem cell therapies in COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm, so uh, my name is Dirk Curry, as, as John said, and I, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to speak about clinical trials of cell therapy in the era of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and coronavirus disease and what we've learned after two years of the pandemic. I will confine this consideration to trials of mesenchymal stromal cells as the rationale and understanding of, of other stem cell therapies in critical care is, is more, much more preliminary. These are my disclosures, which include um, research grants, as John mentioned, um, and I've also received industry funding and uh, collaborate with Sonata Therapeutics and uh, in the past with Tissue Regeneration Therapeutics. So the outline for this talk is as follows. We'll talk about a global view of mesenchymal stroma cell therapy from uh, its inception to, to date. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about a biologic rationale and, and uh, I suppose my lab and, and John's lab um, in particular have focused on a, biolog a biologic rationale for mesenchymal stromal cell therapy uh, over the last 10 years. Um, I'll talk about the clinical trials of MSCs for severe COVID-19 um, which have uh, been published very, very recently and have resulted in an advance in the field, and we'll refer to some future directions. So um, all of my talks about MSCs have a picture of Alexander Friedenstein, and I think um, it's important to talk about the very beginning of MSCs. So the initial description of MSCs is attributed to Alexander Friedenstein. He was a Russian scientist, and he was commissioned by his government to study therapies for radiation-induced bone marrow failure. And he discovered these adherent cells in the bone marrow. They were spindle-shaped, they stuck to plastic, and they formed colonies. And they were able to differentiate into bone cartilage and fat. 
so much later they were termed mesenchymal stem cells and more laterally now we refer to them as mesenchymal stromal cells because their behavior in vivo and in vitro more closely resembles that of a support cell or a stromal cell. So if we look at a timeline of the translation of MSCs from these initial observations towards clinical use, first there was the observation that these cells inhibit T and B cell proliferation. And an early focus was on bone marrow cell transplantation. And in fact, the very first clinical report of MSCs was uh, for a bone marrow transplant. And these reports demonstrated a higher rate of successful stem cell transplantation when MSCs were used together with hematopoietic stem cells. So later, a company, Osiris Therapeutics, they focused on graft versus host disease arising from some observations in these early studies that there was a lower rate of graft versus host disease when MSCs were used. And they published um, a very promising phase two study, but the subsequent phase three was never published and indeed it was not a success, but MSCs did gain a license for graft versus host disease in some jurisdictions like uh, Canada and uh, South Korea and New Zealand. Um, but this led to study of MSCs and other conditions such as ischemic cardiomyopathy and a focus on uh, a lot of preclinical work um, in terms of what MSCs can do um, in terms of immunomodulation and in terms of, of tissue repair. So if we look at all the clinical trials that have been carried out in MSCs, prior to the pandemic, there's hundreds of them. And the majority of these are in the area of immune rejection. So for organ transplantation, um, graft versus host disease and others, liver and kidney, uh, heart and lung transplantation. There's also a focus on conditions such as liver cirrhosis, degenerative conditions where MSCs could provide tissue repair. So liver cirrhosis, macular degeneration, cartilage repair, degenerative diseases of the, uh, of the bone and skeletal system. Uh, there is a big focus on autoimmunity. So in rheumatoid arthritis, in multiple sclerosis, and in inflammatory bowel disease. And you'll also see um, in inflammatory diseases of the lung. So several trials of MSCs have been published in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and and uh, now a few in acute respiratory distress syndrome. So most of these um, clinical studies have taken place in Asia, um, in China, um, and in Europe and in North America. The majority of them are led by academics as opposed to industry. The majority of them are early phase and not very many have translated into phase three studies. And the majority of cells that are used are either bone marrow or umbilical cord. And there's an increasing number laterally of trials using umbilical cord MSCs. MSCs are a living therapeutic. Uh, they secrete cytokines, they secrete chemokines, they secrete growth factors, lipid mediators, microRNA. So, Defining specific mechanisms of action has been really challenging for this living therapeutic. And at, at times, it appears over the last 15 years that there was a new mechanism of action identified on a weekly or a, a monthly basis. It's quite useful to think of MSCs in terms of broad functions. So, and because we're talking about MSCs as a therapeutic, broad functions that would be therapeutically useful. So they include a proliferative function, so hypoxia-inducible factor one, beta catenin and, and Wnt mediate a proliferative, a proliferative function. They can differentiate into bone cartilage and fat, but that's difficult for them to do, and they don't do it a lot in vivo. Um, there is a, a trophic function, so they encourage tissue repair and it underlies their use in a lot of different conditions. So they secrete growth factor like VEGF, HGF, and KGF. There's a big 
focus on their immunosuppressive function and MSCs live in the bone marrow and they keep hematopoietic stem cells from differentiating. So it is um, uh, native to their function, shall we say, to be immunosuppressive. And we know that they secrete a variety of different molecules and, and probably the most studied are um, endolamine uh, um, oxide and uh, prostaglandin E2. Um, and then they also have a homing function. They're able to migrate to, to areas of, uh, of injury, including the lung. So that's all a little bit uh, very, is very broad and, and difficult to, to kind of take on board. Um, but if you ever had a doubt that MSCs had some biologic action, this, this image for me was able to address it. It's taken from our lab in Canada. Um, the, the long elongated cell uh, on the right is a, a mesenchymal stromal cell, and the cell on the left is a monocyte derived macrophage. And you can see there's projections between the MSC and the monocyte, and there are vesicles that have been secreted by the MSC, and you can see that by, by the, um, the FM464 dye. So this is a spinning disc uh, confocal mic microscopy image. So I suppose the, the bottom line is that MSCs communicate with other cells and particularly with monocytes and macrophage. And we spent some time trying to um, really look at this um, uh, communication and look at the function uh, that MSCs confer on macrophage. And it's worth pointing out that if you, if you get rid of macro, macrophage, if you deplete ma monocytes and macrophage from, from animals using clodronate, MSCs don't work. Um, and you might say, what relevance does this have to clinical trials? Well, it's really important that we identify an important mechanism of action so that we can measure cell potency and biologic efficacy in clinical trials. And what we showed here is that MSCs, while they're immunosuppressive, they also encourage phagocytosis. So through this secretion of prostaglandin E2, they seem to encourage the production of reactive oxygen species in uh, monocytes and macrophage, as well as encouraging phagocytosis. And um, not to put just our, our, our own studies, but um, lots of different groups, including our own, have studied MSCs in pneumonia in preclinical models, and it lays the foundation for the, the studies that have come afterwards. So MSCs improve survival in E. coli models of pneumonia and reduce uh, neutrophilic infiltration into the lung and, and through that effect on phagocytosis are able to clear bacteria more effectively. So um, prior again to the pandemic, this was the best evidence that we had for MSC efficacy and Michael Mathe has done a lot of work to advance the field of MSC therapy in critical care and in ARDS. Uh, published this study um, in uh, 2019. I'm sorry, it's not 2021. Uh, and they studied 63 patients with moderate to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. And two thirds of those patients received bone marrow MSCs and one third did not. And if you look at the um, uh, hazard ratio for mortality, it uh, crosses unity, so there was no uh, clinically significant effect, but there was a worrying signal um, for, uh, for harm with the MSCs. And at the same time, uh, there was a, a, a significant reduction in angiopoietin 2, um, which was encouraging that there was some biologic effect. So what they discovered was that um, the, the process by which they washed, thawed, and reconstituted these cells resulted in a lot of cell death. So a lot of these patients were receiving um, dead MSCs, which could only uh, result in, in, in some harm. So we learned a lot from this study. And... Then, of course, coronavirus disease came along and um, 
what is the rationale for the use of MSCs or particular rationale for the use of MSCs in, um, in coronavirus. So we know right now that um, coronavirus is able to gain access to um, respiratory cells through the ACE receptor. We, we know that it gets down into the alveolus and that it does result in a cytokine storm. Um, and I define a cytokine storm as persistent elevation of cytokines like IL-6 over a long period of time. Um, and even though that level mightn't be as high as what you would see in the cytokine release syndromes, um, when there's persistent elevation and it goes on for days and days and maybe even weeks, um, it's, it's appropriate to refer to it as, as a cytokine storm. So uh, MSCs in the first instance have the, have the ability, we've seen it again and again and again in preclinical studies, to, um, to disrupt uh, 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 runaway inflammation. But of course, the, the other side of coronavirus infection is that there's, there's a lot of tissue damage. So um, we're beginning to see the reports on pulmonary fibrosis and how, um, how severe that is. And MSCs have the, the ability to encourage tissue repair. Um, and so there's, uh, there's potential for them there as well. So um, these are all the studies that have been um, performed in uh, using MSCs, some of them not, uh, not randomized, many of them open label studies. Um, so let's uh, take them maybe one by one. Um, Tang et al.'s first study, just looking at two patients, um, and they did have a comparator, but um, uh, it was a historic comparator, and they showed improvements in oxygenation. Hard to know whether that was going to happen anyway without these cells. Um, so uh, Lang et al. have uh, 10 patients that they uh, administered uh, bone marrow MSCs. Again, this is a case control study. Um, and they showed improvements in pulmonary function. Um, so going on down the list, it's probably best that we look at some of the, the larger studies, the well-conducted studies um, that were uh, had randomization and had uh, blinded comparators. And so we'll, we'll look at a few of these in more detail. Um, so the first of this is, is by... Giacomo Lanzoni, and this uh, study was conducted in Miami, Florida. It was um, a phase one going into a phase two uh, control trial. It was investigator initiated. Uh, it was for, uh, performed at um, Jackson Health System in Miami, and it was designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of um, umbilical cord MSCs. So these umbilical cord MSCs were they were obtained from a master cell bank. So there was one single cord that was expanded um, to give the cells that were used in this study. And they randomized uh, 24 patients and um, they didn't lose anybody to follow up and they anal analyzed everybody and, uh, and didn't exclude any anyone from analysis, even though there were patients that were, were censored at one point or another. So there... Um, primary outcome was safety, and when you looked at the, the incidence of adverse events or severe adverse events, they were actually higher in the control group. So they showed that the use of these cells was, was safe. Um, I know this slide is difficult to read, but um, this is how it was reported. They looked at a variety of different um, uh, factors of inflammation, and they demonstrated that there was a reduction in many of them. So an absolute reduction in comparison at day six uh, of GMCSF, interferon gamma, IL-2, IL-5, IL-6, IL-7, TNF-alpha, TNF-beta, um, PDGF, and Rantase. And there was also a reduction in many of these in the uh, umbilical cord group uh, between uh, day zero and day six, whereas that wasn't the case in the control groups at all. 
They've interesting data on survival. I suppose we we need to be really careful in these very small studies when we look at survival. So um, 10 of 12 patients survived in the MSC group versus six of 12 uh, in the control group. Again, there's a lot of um, fragility uh, when we, we look at this, if there was one, if there was a change in just one single number in any of these groups, that significance on the GAN breast law um, uh, and the log rank would, um, would disappear. Um, so severe adver adverse event free survival was improved and time to recovery, they defined as time to recovery as getting out of the, the ICU or getting off oxygen. So very promising result here. The next big study is a 100 patient study that was conducted in Wuhan and what we've got two reports from this study. And it's, it's a little bit different in that um, they didn't include mechanically ventilated patients in the study. They included patients with severe COVID-19 um, as defined by the uh, Chinese Institute of Health um, and they excluded patients who were mechanically ventilated. Um, so what they were looking at here in terms of outcome was they were looking at structural changes on CT. So they were looking at an improvement in aeration and they were looking at uh, a at, at six minute walk test after a year. And um, so we have two publications. Um, and as I said, the follow up was one month or 28 days, uh, three and six months and 12 months. So when we looked at the 28 day data, basically there was in, in, in all patients from baseline, there was an improvement in radiology. So there was uh, a reduction in the, the lesion component, but that reduction in the lesion component was, was better in the umbilical cord MSC group. And I should say there were three doses of, of MSCs uh, administered in this particular study. Uh, and when we looked at um, later time points, uh, months one, month three, um, and out to 12 months, um, there were very small improvements. Um, and this is, um, this underlies a really small improvement in the six minute walk test. So when you look at the distance um, at, some, at some time points, um, so at month one, for example, there is a 17 meter uh, distance between the cell group and the placebo um, in, uh, <clears throat> in the six minute walk test. So some very small but measurable improvements in both structure and function after the administer, administration of MSCs during coronavirus. Um, and the last study we'll talk about is a, a study that's, um, uh, again, only published. Um, it's from Jakarta in Indonesia, um, 40 patients, uh, again, umbilical cord MSCs. Um, and I suppose it is... Um, important to mention because there was an improvement in survival in the MSC group and the biology, the direction of the biology shows that um, IL-6 was reduced in the patients who received uh, MSCs. IL-10 was increased but not significantly. So in summary, what, what we've learned from all of these studies is that MSCs are safe. Um, when they're administered uh, in severe coronavirus disease and severe RDS, there was no increase in severe adverse events. And I think that's really important because there is a worry, particularly given the predilection for uh, microvascular thrombosis in uh, coronavirus disease, administering MSCs that get stuck in the pulmonary vasculature has the potential to make this worse. Um, in study after study, we've seen evidence of immune modulation. So these MSCs, umbilical cord MSCs, and it's worth noting that all of the studies show that there was 90% uh, survival of these cells um, when they were administered. So in, in that scenario, there's immune modulation. And um, we have some evidence that there's tissue repair by virtue of the physiologic improvements we see in some small studies and the radio, radiologic evidence 
uh, we have from the, the uh, um, studies from Wuhan. And finally, there's a directionality. Again, there's um, some improvement in clinical outcomes with the caveat that these studies are, are really very small and, and the, the result is fragile, so it could change very easily. So we know coronavirus disease is, is different um, to um, common or garden uh, ARDS. It has some differences. There's lower expression of interference. There's an increase in thrombotic mediators. But a lot of the pathology is, is the same as the disruption of the alveolar capillary barrier. And there's excessive and damaging uh, inflammation. And MSCs have the potential to um, impact upon this. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Somebody had to make the mute or so might as well be me. Uh, so thanks very much, Jared. That was really interesting to go from the biology through to the, the trials that are reporting. It, it really is the case that if you blink, you'll miss one at this point. It's evolving so quickly. Uh, can I remind uh, the, the viewers to please put questions into the chat? Uh, so it's there on your screen. Just press the chat button and put in your questions and we will then uh, ask those questions in the question section at the end. Uh, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Professor Antonio Artigas is going to speak on nanoparticles, the future for regenerative medicine. And this is a very interesting sort of spin out, we'll say, from our insights from cell therapies. Professor Ant Artigas is the Professor of Applied Physiology and Chair of Sepsis and Acute Respiratory Failure Research at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He was Director of the Intensive Care Medicine Department at the Corporación Sanitaria Universitario Park Tolly from 1988 to 2016. He is now the Emeritus Director and Director of the Pathophysiological Translational and Cell Therapy Laboratory. His research interests are primarily in intensive care focused on ARDS and sepsis, particularly around cell-based therapies. And his, he, he and his team have done some very novel work looking at nanoparticles. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting talk. Uh, and to answer the question, is nanoparticle therapy the future of cell therapy? Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, John, and thank you for, to the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine to, uh, to invite me to participate in this webinar. Uh, you asked uh, to cover a topic uh, that really is difficult, but I will try to, to give you some uh, uh, probably new information that could be, uh, uh, well, I think, interesting for, for the audience. Uh, it's just not working. Uh, no. So I don't have any relevant disclosures. So uh, uh, this uh, research program is funded by different uh, research grants uh, from the uh, national agency in my country and uh, for other agencies of research uh, from uh, uh, outside of my country. And that I will try in the next minute to try to quickly summarize uh, how uh, mesenchymal stromal cells and the extracellular ves vesicles uh, are working and uh, focusing on the gaps and challenges. And, uh, and finally, in the last part of my talk, uh, to focus my presentation on uh, nanoparticles and the nanocarriers and uh, different systems to deliver uh, the drugs and finally some future directions. So as Dr. Curley uh, explained to you, uh, the mesenchymal cells um, uh, uh, can improve uh, the, uh, the prognosis of patients with acute lung injury because until now there is no specific uh, treatment because all the trials, uh, therapeutic trials fail because they were focused only in one pathway, 
The advantage of mesenchymal mesenchymal cells is that they are able to uh, impact and influence on the uh, in, in the different uh, mechanism of this complex uh, uh, disease. And uh, it's, uh, they have a possibility uh, to increase the phagocytosis uh, uh, from the macrophage or from the uh, phagocytosis of bacteria through, L, through LL37. They are also increasing the alveolar fluid clearance uh, through the uh, uh, KGF uh, growth factor and also they are promoting uh, the, uh, the, the, the macro, macrophage M2 uh, that are uh, able to promote the resolution and, uh, of the inflammation and finally they have uh, an impact on, on influence on the endothelial and epithelial uh, cell repair through the angio, angiopoietin one. Uh, this mechanism, this is not an engraftment uh, treatment. This is a, a paracrine or para, uh, paracrine effect that is conducted mainly uh, by the liberation or, or the production of these uh, macrovesicle, extracellular macrovesicles that interact uh, directly uh, with the other cells, mainly with the pulmo, uh, uh, with the leukocytes and the macrophage. So, uh, as it was mentioned, there is a potential therapeutic effect of mesenchymal cells in, in COVID, and I want I don't want to repeat again the same. And uh, and it's important to uh, to consider that uh, the extra cellular vesicles uh, are they have the different uh, cargos or different components uh, inside uh, that mainly, mainly are the microRNA or mRNA or some proteins or lipids or uh, some products of, from uh, DNA. And the role is the, uh, to decrease the inflammation and, uh, and that is very important also for uh, uh, especially for COVID patients uh, to decrease the collagen uh, deposition. So uh, the parking uh, secretions of these uh, um, mesenchymal extracellular uh, vesicles from the mesenchymal cells uh, are based on the growth factors and cytokines. There is a large list. And the uh, contain or cargo of these uh, uh, microRNAs in the extracellular vesicles uh, with uh, different, I have been described, different microRNAs and also the antimicrobial peptides. The problem what is uh, on this uh, cell therapy or uh, exosome uh, uh, therapies is that the, the first problem is the source and the production methods. Uh, some of these production methods are not described and there are used uh, bone marrow umbilical cells or uh, or uh, other uh, mesenchymal cells uh, from other uh, uh, source. And also some are pre-activated uh, and, uh, and we will come back again to, to this. And in some studies, uh, the, we don't know uh, the percentage of cell viability. And there are some uh, studies that they fail because uh, the percentage of cell viability before to administer to the patient uh, was uh, too low. Finally, uh, the, we don't know exactly the optimal dose. Uh, the studies that uh, Dr. Corey uh, showed you, they use a different uh, dose of, uh, uh, of the amount of mesenchymal cells infused to the patients. And, and we don't know the number of the doses and the timing. We don't know how many doses that should be done uh, or give to the patients. And the inclusion criteria, the optimal patient's population and to define the best uh, phenotype uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be uh, um, benefit of this uh, new therapy is not already defined. And I think uh, we need to, to, to focus on this. 
taking a, in consideration the different potential variables that can influence as age, the presence or not the shock or the some biological uh, mediators. And, and this is also very important, the tolerance in elderly patients. And uh, there are uh, also uh, some potential interactions with concomitant therapies, are, for example, corticosteroids or any other immunotherapy uh, signs or the anticoagulant uh, treatment. And, and also the uh, coming to the focus on the extracellular vesicles, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, mes the secretome of the different mesenchymal stromal cells are different in the different organs. And uh, there are some uh, that are natural and some are modified ex exosomes and uh, is not uh, already uh, decided or defined uh, uh, what should be the role. So because of this, there are uh, different groups that are interested now uh, to focus uh, or to move uh, to uh, investigate uh, their efforts in the labs, uh, mainly in the preclinical level uh, right now, on the, to develop a cell-free therapy uh, for COVID-19 or for other non-COVID ARDS patients or septic patients. Mainly, uh, uh, the objective is to have uh, secretome uh, pharmacological preparation that can be uh, given to the patients, uh, improving uh, the lung injury or the uh, blood coagulation, the, uh, the coagulopathy, and the dysfunction on the different organs. Now, so uh, the uh, just to summarize you is the, the different three types of uh, extra uh, extracellular vesicles, the uh, from uh, microvesicles or exosomes or the apoptotic uh, uh, components uh, are uh, producing an anti-inflammatory and immunoregulation effect. They have uh, the capability to repair the alveolar epithelial and endothelial cells damage. They improve uh, the reabsorption of lung edema. They inhibit the, uh, the deposit of uh, uh, and the production of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and they have an uh, antimicrobial activity. So there are two uh, ways uh, to payload uh, these ex uh, exosomes. First is the exosome is uh, uh, payload, uh, that means is to take the nanoparticles and uh, to have to develop a therapeutic nanoparticles. Uh, that can be used uh, for treatment these patients, and that uh, they also can uh, be uh, binded uh, to the surface of cells or in introducing the cells by uh, some physical or chemical uh, uh, methods. And also the endogenous payload through the uh, introducing genetic material, uh, mainly viral uh, vectors, or uh, through the preconditioning uh, with uh, cytokines, or for example, also from LPS, or uh, from uh, changing the uh, conditions of these uh, mesenchymal cells, for example, uh, with hypoxia. Uh, there are two ways uh, to administer these, uh, uh, these uh, nanoparticles. Uh, first is to uh, give uh, this uh, treatment directly to the lung uh, and producing a, a decrease of the inflammation of the edema, uh, increasing the bacterial cleaving uh, and to have an immunodulatory effect. Or, uh, or, 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 and uh, to administer by systemic delivery, uh, uh, mainly focus on the effect on the endothelial cells. The nanoparticles, uh, the characteristics are uh, that they have a high drug low capacity. They can be engineered. I think this is very important. Uh, I, uh, today is an attractive uh, uh, method for drug delivery. Uh, 
they have an immune evasion in vivo, so they cannot be recognized by uh, by the uh, by the immunologic uh, uh, system, and they can be engineering to enable uh, to a specific uh, target. So we can just send uh, to a specific uh, uh, damage tissue damage that we are interested. Uh, the biological nanocarriers uh, are three types, and uh, the extracellular vesicles, the lipid, uh, is, this is the liposomes, or the biosynthetic engineering nanoparticles, where I will try to condensate, uh, concentrate my last part of my talk. That we did in, in our lab uh, is uh, to precondition or preactivate the mesenchymal cells. Uh, by LPS, and as you can see uh, in this uh, picture, uh, the mesenchymal cells pre-activated with LPS are able uh, to increase the percentage of, uh, of uh, secretion of exosomes. Uh, and I think this is uh, an important uh, uh, point uh, to, to consider. Uh, then uh, we were interested to see if these uh, uh, exosomes uh, they have the, the capability uh, to uh, regenerate uh, the tissue damage. And uh, as you can see, uh, when the exosomes pre-activated by LPS, they have the higher capability uh, to uh, regenerate uh, the, the damaged tissue. This is a scratch assay, and you can see at 24 hours, uh, we, we were able to uh, improve uh, the regeneration uh, tissue capacity. Then uh, we were interested to analyze the different components of, of these uh, uh, ex exosomes uh, uh, obtained with the pre-activated uh, or non-pre-activated uh, uh, mesenchymal cells. Uh, in the left side, you have uh, the control exosomes, and in the right side, the exosomes pre-activated by LPS. And uh, among uh, a large list of proteins, we were able to differentiate uh, the distribution and the characteristics of the proteins that are uh, produced uh, uh, in uh, both uh, different uh, exosomes. And we were interested and able to identify some proteins as the annexin 2 that are specific for uh, regenerative uh, or they have a regenerative potential uh, activity. So uh, annexin 2, uh, they increase the cell proliferation by binding the P50 uh, and translocation to the nucleus. And, uh, I, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, in this diagram here, you can see uh, better probably. You see that the LPS exosomes uh, increase the percentage of cell viability compared with the uh, control. Uh, we know also, and we were interested to uh, identify the, the other components of the exosomes uh, that are the uh, microRNAs or the messenger messenger uh, RNA, and the, uh, we know that there are some uh, microRNAs that has been uh, described previously, and we found uh, uh, quasi exactly the same uh, that they have the potential effect uh, to reduce the alveolar uh, neutrophile uh, influx. Uh, they uh, have. Uh, uh, or they reduce the protein permeability and the uh, pulmonary edema. They have an anti-inflammatory effect uh, of the uh, macrophage. So uh, to consider then we, uh, after identifying the cargo of these exosomes, uh, it was necessary to uh, include this in uh, nanocarriers. And uh, the, uh, uh, when we are considering uh, the different nanocarriers, it's important to consider the surface, mainly the uh, the, uh, the, car the the electronic surface, 
the shape of these uh, nanocarriers and the material, they can be or polymer particles or liposomes, for example, and also very important, the size. As low as the size, the less probably uh, potential uh, negative effect or adverse effect uh, can be, uh, especially when you are infusion uh, intravenously. So uh, what we expect, uh, uh, what could be the benefits? Uh, the benefits could be to reduce the toxic uh, systemic effect, uh, as I mentioned to you, by these characteristics of these nanocarriers, the possibility to, to release the payload on demand and uh, or uh, to use several stimulation uh, as, for example, the pH or enzymatic pro uh, process, etc and the possibility to co-deliver uh, several drugs, improving uh, therapeutic index, increasing the viability of hydrophobic uh, drugs, uh, um, and also to uh, possible uh, to couple therapy with the diagnosis and uh, to target this drug to specific sites. The ideal nanoparticles or nanocarriers should be uh, biocompatible, uh, they can have or should have uh, high drug loading uh, to have a long circulation time, releasing programmability or, or through an external uh, stimulus uh, to have also the diagnosis uh, capability and uh, to be uh, clear uh, effectively uh, uh, from the border. There are uh, different uh, uh, parts that are important. The first is the anatomical road uh, to deliver, uh, can be directed to the lung uh, and has some advantages, especially, for example, for ARDS uh, COVID-19. Uh, also, the, uh, the molecular aspect, I mean, the, 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 the different components of the cargo that you will include in these nanocarriers, and the temporal aspect as uh, when this should be done, uh, when should be repeated uh, the dose, etc. So just to give you some uh, preliminary data that uh, are not uh, already published, but uh, uh, using the uh, these kind of uh, nanocarriers that are the uh, polymer uh, lactic uh, glycolic uh, acid. Uh, these are uh, carriers that are already accepted and approved by the FDA and the EMEA uh, to deliver some uh, specific drugs and are used in, in different diseases, for example, in cancer. And you can see, uh, if you look on the, the surface, the negative or positive surface, uh, the percentage of the cells uh, with these nanocarriers uh, may, uh, can be different. And uh, when the uh, surface is negative, you can see here the, the capacity to have uh, cells with these nanocarriers uh, is higher. And uh, when you look on the intracellular uh, 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 capture of these, uh, of these uh, nanocarriers, the area, or that means the amount, is much higher uh, when uh, these uh, nanocarriers uh, are negative or compared with the positive nanocarriers. We were interested also to look on the biodistribution. Um, are these nanocarriers, if you install it directly to the, or you get directly to the lung, the distribution is quite homogeneous? And the answer is yes. You see these uh, nanocarriers were uh, identified in the different, uh, uh, among all the different lobes uh, of the lung. So uh, just to conclude and uh, to, uh, for uh, to this talk is uh, I think it's uh, there's we need to, to improve uh, some areas as for example the safety uh, we need to, uh, to optimize the carrier and the therapeutic choice of, of the cargo of these uh, of these uh, nanocarriers uh, I, I think we need to. Uh, define the route of administration, intravenous or uh, or uh, directing the lung according to the disease of the patient that we want to treat. Uh, 
And finally, there are some uh, logistics uh, problems that need to be solved as the production and commercialization impediments and to uh, solve the regulatory and le legislative uh, uh, consideration. And with this, uh, I just, before to finish, to thank uh, the people from my lab, uh, especially Aina, Arain, and Marta Kamprubi, that they did uh, the majority of the, of the work that I showed to you. And uh, I'm uh, open for any questions uh, from you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, we've had a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll start straight away and I'm going to direct the first few to Professor Curley and uh, also uh, Professor Antigas, if you want to join in and then I have some uh, for you as well. So uh, Jared, the first question we have is, um, is there any pediatric data or experience with MSC therapy in severe ARDS due to COVID? So, so there are no cl uh, clinical trials, uh, John, but there are there are plenty case reports um, that have outlined the use of MSCs in uh, in children, um, and uh, there there have been uh, many of the case reports are uh, describe MSC use as a rescue therapy for uh, for a very severe disease. Um, it's very hard to know what to make of these. Um, uh, I, I think that um, we we really we really need trials to 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 demonstrate whether there's you know uh, biologic efficacy and then um, the the appropriate uh, dosing and timing and I. I, I really wouldn't advocate any of this um, this type of uh, rescue therapy um, with with something that might work but might might be harmful as well. Um, so I, I think the evidence is lacking there. I think there's great uh, preclinical evidence for uh, for MSCs in um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia um, and. That uh, I, I think that uh, Bernard Thibault and his uh, his group have have done a lot of work in terms of advancing that, um, but I'm I'm not aware of uh, any other work uh, outside of that apart from case reports. Yeah, that's my understanding of it as well. You know, I think uh, there's some, yeah, as you said, case reports, and we have to be very careful with the interpretation of that. Okay, so I have another question I wanted to ask you, Jar, and I might then ask you, Antonio, to come in as well. But it's a question asking uh, about the delivery of MSCs. And so asking, you know, can they be delivered uh, directly into the lung uh, by the inhalational route? Are there advantages and disadvantages to that approach? Uh, and just how would you compare respiratory delivery versus systemic? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fantastic question, and it has, has certainly something that um, that you you and I have considered over many years. And um, so the the first thing to say about delivery is that when you give MSCs intravenously, they're they're physically trapped in the pulmonary vasculature, and we have thought of that largely as an advantage while at the same time in the back of our heads we're a little bit concerned that if if dosing is is overzealous that it it could actually act as as a and as a, as an obstruction in the pulmonary vasculature and in fact we've we've seen that so when we we do our inter, intravital microscopy studies we see these uh, these cells being given intravenously, they they shoot along in the pulmonary vasculature until they uh, they come to uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an arterial capillary junction and they stop, and that just tells you that they're physically entrapped, and that um, we we think that in infection or in injury that uh, there is a a mechanism whereby they. 
are retained through a receptor interaction um, in the pulmonary vasculature. That differs from what happens in the systemic vasculature where a lot of groups have shown that there's, there's rolling and adhesion and they, um, that they act more like white cells. Um, so MSCs are physically trapped when you give them intravenously. The, the dosing has to be careful. Uh, but when we look at, um, uh, 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 when we look 24 hours later even, or 48 hours later, we certainly see that MSCs are gone. So that's another consideration that their longevity um, in the pulmonary vasculature is, is, a, is a concern. And what we saw with some of those studies is that they're, they're just going ahead with repeated dosing. One of the studies gave cells twice a day for three separate days. Uh, so I think that's probably the direction that we'll be, we'll be going in. Administering um, MSCs directly um, into the lung, again, uh, intratracheally has its, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, I believe that the local effect is important. I believe that um, while MSCs have a lot of paracrine and trophic effects, that, that those paracrine effects are, are exerted in a local manner. Um, and if they're very distant to the site or they can't get to the site or they leave the site in the, in the vasculature, um, well, they probably can't have the same effect. Um, the, the difficulty about administering any medication and cell therapy, of course, being a difficult medi medication, um, is, is getting it down into injured areas that are, uh, that are collapsed, consolidated, Full of inflamed um, uh, fluid. So I think the same kind of considerations apply to any um, uh, intratracheal therapy. We, we, we had difficulty with surfactant many, many years ago, and um, we are getting much better at uh, the technology of, of nebulization. And I think that has a, a promise and has promised from the the microparticle, nanoparticle point of view, I worry about whether that would cause a lot of disruption to, to cells. So that's, that's what I know about it. Thanks, Jerry. I wonder, uh, Antonio, would you think that nebulization for your nanoparticles might be a, a, an option going forward? What would you have to say well, about that? Uh, the, the idea is uh, to, uh, to give the nanoparticles directed to the lung because uh, when you look on the, uh, the uh, biological changes in, in these patients in the lung, uh, for example, in the bowel, and you compare with uh, uh, changes in the uh, plasma, in the peripheral circulation, are completely different. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to, to, to have a high concentration of the treatment in the place uh, where really there is uh, the problem. Uh, I, I have... a. Uh, uh, before to, to move uh, to another question is to ask uh, to Gerard, do you have any information on the combination of uh, mesenchymal cells and uh, anticoagulants? Just to, to try to prevent uh, the uh, potential risk of uh, vascular obstruction, especially when you are giving uh, a high number of uh, mesenchymal cells. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um... Antonio, one of the things we've been we've been trying to look at is the, uh, the 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 actual the effects of of MSCs on tissue factor and and von Willebrand factor um, and is is there just to begin with what's the what's the pro coagulant um, potential of MSCs because I think that we haven't really looked at it and I suppose coronavirus inspired us to say, well, okay, coagulation is an important component of, of viral pneumonia and coronavirus disease in particular. And um, so what, what our preliminary data is, show, is showing us, is there's a little concern for a signal that there, there may be a procoagulant factor. Now you have to remember at the same time that if there, there are such good immunomodulators and IL-6 is driving, uh, coagulation um, in the lung, well, maybe um, that that balance is uh, is important. In relation to the heparin, all I'm I, I'm I'm aware of uh, preclinical studies with uh, 
um, where heparin has been administered, and I can't specifically remember them right now, but uh, you know, demonstrating an improvement uh, in effect. But I, I'm a, apart from our data, our own data showing that MSCs have the potential to make coagulation locally worse. I I, I don't know anything else. Okay, it's very interesting. Um, and obviously, this is what we need to do, you know, figure out these problems, try to see around corners when we're uh, translating these. So I'm conscious of time. There's one question I want to ask both of you. You can only give one answer. Uh, and it is, what do you consider the best biomarker to assess the effect of MSCs? That's the million dollar question. But anyway, so I'll start with you, Jer. The best biomarker of effect. If you had to pick one. Oh, I only get one. Okay. Well, you can pick two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have to say that I would um I would I would pick a cytokine biomarker and um maybe my you know recent experience. Um none are none are perfect, all are highly variable um at baseline, um, but the consistent one. Um, is uh, is IL six, and then I pick soluble TNF receptor um, as a second one because um, it is uh, it is kind of long lived and uh, maybe a little less variable. And and are you talking in this in the setting of COVID or would this be in any ARDS? I, I think common or garden ARDS. Okay, Antonio. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, is, if you consider that uh, in these patients with acute lung injury, the main uh, fact is the inflammatory, uh, the, pulm the lung uh, inflammatory, acute or lung inflammatory response is just to check on the immunomodulatory uh, potential effect of uh, mesenchymal cells uh, or the uh, exosomes. And uh, so any pro-inflammatory cytokine, as for example, uh, IL-6, uh, that is probably uh, uh, the most common uh, uh, cytokine uh, determined in these patients uh, could be. But uh, also it could be interesting to, to have a look on the, this mediator, not only in the, in the plasma of, peripher of peripheral samples, but uh, it could be important to to have uh, or to analyze this uh, in the uh, pulmonary samples. So, I mean, from the mini ball or the ball uh, uh, samples. And, uh, and for COVID, uh, I, I think it could be also interesting because there are some COVID patients that they develop uh, in a more late phase uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, any, any biomarker as uh, procal Procollagen three or someone, some one of these uh, uh, could be interesting to uh, to see uh, if the uh, the cell therapy is uh, really uh, improving uh, the pulmonary polyborosis in these patients. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, going to wrap up. I want to thank both of our speakers, Professor Jerry Curley uh, from Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin and Professor Antonio Artigas from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I think we had a great hour. It absolutely flew from my point of view. And uh, I have loads more questions that people want to ask. Uh, so maybe we'll follow up afterwards with those. Um, but on behalf of the SICM, I want to thank both of you and also thank uh, those of you who tuned in uh, to the webinar. Uh, I hope this gives you a taste of what I think is a very exciting area uh, of medicine for the treatment of ARDS. So with that, I'll say thank you, and we will see you again soon. Thanks, John.